while I wait, I, I want to thank the opportunity to speak to this distinguished audience here, and I'll talk about the problem that, uh, ep no, it's still 14. I will talk a problem that uh, were, is a major problem in structural biology and consequence to disease. I have been working on protein folding and molecular motors and even large systems like the ribosome that Adam may tell you a little bit about it. But this, I will say that the past, I think the future one of the systems wanted to do is the, is the genome folding and, and how it works. Still the time is wrong there, but. Yeah. Still the time is wrong there, should be 20 minutes. Should be 20 minutes. Okay, the genome is a, it's a fantastic molecule and the consequence, it's a, it's a two meter long molecule that you have to fold in the, let me talk about the interface, in a nucleus that's a micrometer in size. And the consequence of, of this structure affects all that we have to know about gene expression and the consequences on the cell. But more than that, we have to fold without forming knots. And that makes the problem even more complicated. How you have this big molecule, it's express gene, you don't want to make too many knots, otherwise you cannot sort of open and close in order to form that. So that's one of the big problems that we are dealing with it these days. And the techniques that people have been using to understand this problem, there are two things. One is fish data, it's an old technique, it's getting more popular these days. But the other one is this sort of chromosome conformational capture where people are able to measure which parts of the chromosome come together and you measure that by chemical methods, and you have a map, like the one you have below, where this is a contact map that gets two parts of the chromosome and tell how they come together, and the darker is the color, the more likely is for that contact to be formed on the ensemble of structures. One of the main techniques that's been used to that is something called HI-C. It's done by our collaborator, Ed Aydan, that together with the theoretic work works with us, and basically, they go through a series of chemical steps. I'm sorry, I, I forgot I don't have a pointer here. They went through a series of chemical steps to figure out which part of the chromosomes are together, and you can build those maps. I want to go through that. It's amazing this technique works. It's a through the force of stuff, but we have been working with that. Uh, here is something that's very important. This slide is very important for everything I'm going to tell you today. One is, here is a contact map, and the side, left side is the chromosome 13. It's hard to read from here. And what you see from this map is that there are patterns that come together. You see that some areas, there you have dark, red, dark, direct, you go to the other one, you, say, you have then. And if you go by, by machine learning, you can learn some different patterns, and they divide this chromosome into types that we call types A and types B. They're areas that tend to come together. And this is a very important problem in biology today because, uh, because uh, these types actually are like oil and water, they phase separate and they tend to come together. So you have these parts tend to come together. But what's very interesting is that these types are related in the top to different histone markers that mean to epigenetics, I won't go into details with you, that tells you, for example, that things with different markers in epigenetics, not the sequence of bases, but the epigenetics decides which parts come together. So to make life simpler, we're going to say that areas that tend to be more methylate and acetylate on the chromosome tend to be more attracted to each other than areas that are less methylate and acetylate. And you see the epigenetics is important because, for example, on the right, you see two cells here. The left is a lymphoblastoid, there's a blood cell. On the right is a, is a lung cell. And you see their patterns are different. And that tells you that's epigenetics, not the sequence, but these are both human cells. They have the same DNA, but they have different epigenetics, different markers, so different genes being expressed. So the beauty of this model, like I said, is that the epigenetics that comes from not only methylation acetylation, but also from enhancer transcription factors, this is the part that affects the structure, and that's what we have to understand. So what you have here is, like I said, in the top, you see different, you actually can break this genome into A's and B regions, and that's you can think about as being like oil and water. The A's try to come together with the A's, and B's try to come back to the B's, and actually, you have, uh, you have extra separation on subtypes, A1 and A2, and then B is B1, B2, B3, 4, so you can break this genome into these bits. So you can treat my genome now as being a copolymer, okay? If it was a protein, I would call a copolymer with bits that could be polar or hydrophobic. 
But here, I'm just, they just have the same name, they tend to phase separate. And what happens, as you can see on the bottom figure, is that these patterns that come together happens that beads of the same time come together and tend to phase separate. So the consequence we have here is a model that we create. The first part is, if you look in the middle, there's the cooperative instruction types. If I just let work with two types here, blue and red, the blues try to come together and the reds try to come together, I can get the instruction in three dimension. The second part I'm going to tell you a little bit in a little bit, is that actually you can learn what the ABs are from the epigenetic information. There's the chip seek that comes before. Okay? So getting the chip seek information, that's pretty much get the tells you what these markers are from epigenetics. I can predict the types, and from the types I can predict the structure, and then I can compare to the high C map and get the structure of the systems. And we're getting a very successful technique to do that, and we're learning how to go after the system. So to have an idea here is how do, now in order to develop find a structure, I have to have an energy function. So my energy function has three terms on it, just to give a little bit of physics now, how theoretical physics can help structural biology. I get a copolymer theory here, I have these polymers, and I say now I have, like you said there, six types, or two types and other things as subtypes. I can build a copolymer, and I have a term on my energy that tells you how these things of the same color try to come together. The second term is when loops are formed in that structure, they come through markers of particular protein marker, I don't have time, it's called CTCF, that tell these things come together. And the third part is a very important part that doesn't happen columns together, that tells you the beads that are close to each other on sequence, they tend to, they are more attractive than ships that are very far in sequence. So look, so I have two terms on my Hamiltonian that are very important. One that's space dependent, that tells which things want to come close in space. The other one is the sequence dependent, that tells you what things to try to come together. The beauty of that is we can put all that into a particular, and, and the consequence of that, the local term is that creates this sort of system we call liquid crystalline behavior that form helixes of helix of the system, and that's in our opinion probably the origin of having very few knots, but we still have to work on this term. So what are we doing in physics? What we do in physics here now is we write a Hamiltonian, sorry about this equation, just to show you. I write a term, the first term is a homopolymer model, typical homopolymer, with a little bit that's a soft homopolymer because since you have topwise homomerizations, the chains may cross a few times. The second term is the yellow parts, the beads that try to phase separate. The third term is the loop, and the fourth term in blue is the sequence dependent. Now what do we do? We teach the system. We write this energy, the stuff we don't know, we learn by what people call maximum entropy, it's machine learning method. We go after the system, and uh, what you have is basically you just iterate. So you get these maps that compare experimental maps with theoretical maps. The top of diagonal is theory, that's why you have with this small computer there. The bottom are experiments, and we can compare how these, these things look. The system is trained on chromosome 10, and then we apply to all the other chromosomes, the humans, or the other 22 chromosomes to avoid the, or avoid the sex chromosomes. And you see that you have a Pierce correlation function for the one we train of about 0.95, and the other ones with the same Hamiltonian now, just the different, different chromosomes have different A's and B's, different sequences to do that. So I become very happy that you can predict these things quite well. As long as I, as long as I know which part of the chromosome, and just to stop here for a second, the A's and B's is like, A is more like heterochromatin, I'm sorry, eochromatin, is the more gene active part of the gene, and the B's ones are more heterochromatin, that's the structural part of the genome, and tries to go a bit more inside. So there's a big correlation between structure, phase separation, and function. And that's the beauty of this problem, right? Basically, the A's, so things that are gene active, try to separate with things that are gene active, things that are non-gene active, try to separate the other way, and that determines the structure of the chromosome. That's a very important thing, because until now, people were talking about the chromosome just based in gene expression, just in terms of transcription factors or things here, I tell you how a structure is also part of the gene expression process. So, like I said, so the first part, number two, I told you, I'm able to create an energy function or a Hamiltonian that predicts me the structure. The first part is how we do that from the chip seek information. And the beauty is we just have a recent paper where we did that together with that, is, is that basically we have this method called Begabase with all the words that are in there involved, but the bottom line is we try to correlate these types, use machine learning to learn from a few chromosomes, and then we use for all the other things. So the idea again, as I told you, as you can see, 
this slide I already showed you, but to show the pattern that we have below, remember, dark land means contacts are related to the chip seek or to the, in this case, I show, I show some information. You can see, for example, in the middle where you have the white, red, white, red, that's related to one particular histone form modification. So you can see that there is this correlation. So on this model, what we do is we align my entire chromosome, and then below I put all the chip seek information. And that each line in the bottom, in the top one is the A's and B's, but the other lines tell me how much these things are modified for a particular histone modification. And I have all this information. So now what I do, I do a sequence for each point. The first position of my sequence is the type, as you can see there, and the other one is all the position of experimental data. So now I can look at covariance of this information. Not only covariance between the type and each of the experiments, but among experiments. So now I can get back and forth and try to learn if I can have a predictor. That's the beauty of theoretical physics, a problem when you have just covariance problem and types. We can map what we call a POTS model, that's a generalized uh, Ising Hamiltonian. And now we can solve on field and this problem becomes, the inference problem of doing machine learning here becomes very easy. So it's a beautiful technique to go there and now if I have a, the largest probability, I can predict <coughs> which are my types. So now I'm in particular good shape because now if I look in the top, what I have is if I have all the chip seek information, I can predict what are the types. And remember what I told you, types of the kind A are more gene expressive. And then if I have the types, I can use my energy function and get the structures in the bottom. Okay? So that's where we are. So in a sense, you can see, and now if I have the structures, I can compare with the high C data and see the power of my method, and you can see there, it's hard for going details with you now, but you see I have two particular chromosomes. The top part, I just got that map and I turn around, the diagonal in the middle. The top part is theory, the part by the experiments, and each box on the side, the particular domains that are very far from the diagonal to show that my prediction is very good. And we're very happy to do that. So what we do now is, in this particular lymphoblastoid cells, learning from chromosome 10, that's this test set in the middle, I can predict quite well the other chromosomes. And now, recent work unpublished, we're just trying to go there, we can actually start to look at different human cells and show the same Hamiltonian that I learned in one chromosome from a lymphoblastoid cell, I can go for other cells here, and you can see that we have, uh, uh, we have two different cells, basically. The left is the one I learned, that's the lymphoblastoid. Now I have been going to, to a mammary epithelial cell or to endothelial cell, and we have a mess that can predict that. Now, if I have that in mind now, I'm very happy because now I can do predictions. And what these predictions tell me? That's the big game now. We work on protein folding, and our goal before in protein folding is now we can say that we understand that all the physics of protein folding, but we are not able to predict protein, uh, structures quite well. Chromosomes different. We understand nothing about the physics, but we can predict structures quite well. What it means is we learn this Hamiltonian from the types. Now we try to understand the details of it, but we can do very good predictions. So what's the consequence of these predictions? That's the beauty of this problem. If you can get these structures, what can you do? If I look how these structures look like when I get them, what do I learn? One thing I learn is basically, in everything, I'm going to show up the two panels on the right. The top is my full Hamiltonian, my full energy function. The bottom is just if I use a homopolymer that tells you what happens if I just have a, a baseline. And you see from the peak in red and from the peak in green, this, the entire size there is the largest clusters, that A's clusters and the B clusters. So I have phase separation between A's and B's. The second part, not only they phase separate, but as you can see, the A's, if you look in the top figure there, they tend to be more to the surface than the B's. That means the gene expressing part has to be outside. The things that are expressing genes have to be outside so that base the genes can be easily expressed better. More interesting, is that if I put two chromosomes, remember I just taught everything in a single chromosome, but if I put two chromosomes together, not only the A's and B's phase separate, but the chromosome phase separate. 
as people know from experiments. So this information inside the chromosome, and you know if the chromosomes don't phase separate, you can create lots of diseases. So that's the beauty of this problem, because these things just happen to be phase separate as you want. Now, if I want to continue my understanding of that, the model can give to you, is the highly expressed genes tend to co-localize. So that's the beautiful part. It's structured as something because remember, as you're expressing something, the genes have to come out, and you learn, look in the bottom, if you just do the homopolymer things, you have very small clusters of genes, the other one, the genes come together. That's a big discussion these days, theoretical and experimental, how is structure controlled gene expression, and I think we, our, we are doing this work, and the theory of this experiment now is helping us to do these things. So you have these transcription factors. Another interesting thing about these factors is that you observe that you have a certain structure to express. Not only you do the genes that are doing the action, but also the genes that produce transcription factor, they're all expressing together. So they really force the Hamiltonian to go to that structure. And finally, to remember, how do I avoid knots? And like I said, the beautiful part we believe has to do is that gamma D that comes from our Hamiltonian that tells you that don't things don't come together. The beauty of this Hamiltonian is able to do that. If you remove, if you remove that term, that's the sequence dependent term, you are going to get knots. And that's a term that doesn't exist on regular physical Hamiltonians. The more you can do in protein folding is believe that when you form an alpha helix that you have II plus four, that's a sequence dependent here, no, this, this term is stronger, and it's very important to create that term, what I call the helices of helices, and that force. And the consequence of that, as you can see on the next slide, is that if you look here, the, co co the comparison with uh, knots and knots, the red is my Hamiltonian, the blue is the comparison to the, to the homopolymer, just to have an idea. I could use Alexander polynomials, but that's too mathematical for now, so I'm going to tell you what I call minimal rope lengths. And that means that topologically, if you have just a ring, you can reduce the ring without crossing anything until you come to something the size of two diameters. But if you have a knot, and you can reduce this length, you're going to end up, you cannot cross two things. So you're going to get an extra diameter. The more knots you have, the larger is what you call this minimal rope lengths. So you can see from this plot here, that basically you have based very few knots forms on, on this system. My, my description is, the reason you have multiple descriptions there is because we have an ensemble of distribution. Remember, this is not a pure structure, that's a liquid-like system that's moving, but you see they form very few knots. And that comes compared to what you have on a homopolymer, and that's the beauty of the systems. So now we have a model that you're very, very happy to understand these things. So what's very interesting for people that are into the game is the following thing. If I have just a normal globule, a normal homopolymer, it's going to form a system that's heavily knotted on the left. There's an idea where people say, if I collapse very fast, there's what people call a fractal globule, I could have no knots. But if they have one crossing, you become very knot. In our model shows that even if you start knotted, with these few crossings, my equilibrium state is going to be a no knotted state. So this is sort of a very interesting thing that comes here, just to conclude, to believe that we have this competition on into, the, into the DNA folding. Just I was not careful enough at the beginning. Remember that our resolution here is 50 kilobases. We are not on a single base resolution, right? Based these things that this polymer, we are doing it. But we can get these structures, and now we can study dynamics, we can study gene expression, and you have a beautiful model. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges in structural biology these days. I think the collaboration between theory and experiments and the effects on disease are enormous because we understand how structural change, say, how these things phase separate. So this concept of phase separation is great in biology, and here's a great example where it shows up. So with that, I want to thank your attention.